I'm Dr. Melissa Lem, and I'm here on behalf of the Canadian Association of Physicians for the Environment, and we're here on our Vancouver stop of our Voices from the Sacrifice Zone tour, where we're bringing people from northern BC down to talk about the effects that the LNG and fracking industry have had on them. And we are so pleased tonight to have with us Dr. David Suzuki, who's going to answer a few questions. Welcome, Dr. Suzuki. Good to be here. All right, so our first question is, why are the LNG and fracking industry something that we as British Columbians and Canadians should be concerned about right now? Well, I think it's all people now. The reality is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, said in October that we've got to keep uh, temperature from rising more than 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels uh, by the end of this century. And uh, that's a very tough asks, ask. Our pr Prime Minister in 2015 went to Paris, signed the Paris Agreement that said we'll try to limit temperature rise to 1.5 to 2, and he said we've got to try to keep it as close to 1.5 as we can. He was right. He was right, and we've made that commitment. But in order to reach that now, we know that we can't just fool around with a little carbon tax here and, you know, cap and trade over there. and. We now need a definite commitment that says we've got to reduce fossil fuel use by 6% every year so that by the year 2030 we've reduced 45% and by the year 2050 100%. And that's the target, that's what we've got to do uh, if we're going to meet the uh, IPCC target. Right, and we, and we can't be investing in new fossil fuel infrastructure. It's crazy, right? Right. absolutely crazy. I mean the. What this says is right away, we've got to start cutting back on our fossil fuel use. So we're going to have to leave most of the fossil fuel in the ground where we already know it's there. Our known deposits, we know we can't exploit them all. So what the hell are we doing exploiting more? In fact, what we should be doing is shutting down right away extreme oil. That's, that's tar sands oil, deep sea oil. It means fracking. Fracking is the dumbest way to get energy I can imagine. Going down and smashing shale rock in order to release the little bubbles of, of uh, gas in there and having to use tremendous amounts of, of water laced with chemicals that we don't even know is in there. This is nuts. So fracking has got to be one of the first things that we shut down in the fossil fuel industry. Right. If we're going to take the IPCC report seriously. And here in Canada, um, one of the major parts of the fracking and LNG infrastructure is going to be the coastal gas link pipeline, which is going to deliver gas from, from the Peace region to the coast, and it's running through Wet'suwet'en territory. So about a year ago, you went up to Unistoten territory to see what was happening with the camp and um, just to show your support. So I'm wondering what you learned when you were up there and why you thought it was important to show Well, it. these are people, I mean, I, I didn't sense that it was thrown up to stop the pipeline per se. Five, six years ago, a group went up and said, you know, this is our land. Can we actually live on that land in a sustainable way, in the tradition of our elders? And it's cold up there. When I went up, it, was, uh, it wasn't freezing cold covered in snow, but I know in the winter it's very cold. And those people have struggled and tried to establish a community, growing their own food and um, living in their own structures. And I was so impressed because they, by exerting sovereignty over their land, are now charged with protecting the land in return for making a living. They should be a model for the way we're all going to have to try to live in the future. I was very impressed with their determination, uh, very impressed with how difficult it is up there. It's not just cold in the winter. In the summer, there are black flies and mosquitoes. I don't know about you, but I find that, you know, that's a hard way to live, but they're doing it. Right, and they're setting an example for all of us Absolutely. in leading the way, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, what do you think about people who say that um, LNG is a cleaner transition fuel between coal and the renewable energy well, future? LNG might, but we're not talking LNG, we're talking LFG. This is frack gas. It's a very big difference when you push a pipe in the ground and get gas, that's natural gas. But when you have to put a pipe in the ground, pump under heavy pressure, uh, water and chemicals, that's no longer natural gas, that's frack gas. And uh, I've forgotten what the question was. Right, well, I mean, what do you think about people saying it's a transition fuel? Oh, yeah, right? yeah. 
We now know from studies that we uh, that the foundation did with the university researcher that the uh, the escape from L LNG uh, LFG um, plants or or at least uh, sites well sites there's a tremendous amount of methane that escapes and we know that methane is up to 80 times more potent to greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. So in extracting this gas, we're also releasing into the atmosphere much more carbon than would be gained just by burning that gas. So I think that the footprint, the carbon footprint from frac gas is, is way higher, and we gotta shut it down, it's as simple as that. So uh, it's not a transition fuel, and um, that's, we should be shutting down coal, we should be shutting down oil, and the real natural gas is the last gas that will, or fossil fuel that we'll get rid of. But stop trying to pose frac gas as if it's natural gas. Right, and so we're relying on indigenous peoples to help us. Another group that's really come to the fore lately are kids, right? On March 15th, we saw over 1.4 million kids, students across the world march um, as part of the school strike to demand action from politicians yeah. on climate change. What do you think we as adults can do, the top three things we could do to move the public and political dialogue? Well, first of all, I think we have to take what they're saying very, very seriously. They're the, Greta Thunberg has galvanized uh, a lot of us around the world because she is daring to say what so many of us, including environmentalists like me, don't want to say. You know, they, what is not going on now is affecting her future. And I can tell you what's shocking to me is I've met a number of people now who have teenage children. They know about climate change and they're saying, Mom, Dad, we're going to be dead by the time we're 35. I've got friends who've had to send children into therapy because they've basically they're terrified by what's happening. Greta Thunberg said it straight away. Don't tell us these things you're doing. Look at what, you're, you're, what, what the result of what you're doing is. You're jeopardizing my future. Stop all this talk, do something about it. And uh, that's galvanized a lot of people. And so from me, from my standpoint, I think give the kids the, the table to, to say this because they're the ones that are going to be the real victims. In the name of profit now, we're just ruining a future for our children. That's just wrong. Thank goodness that, that there is this movement. And I think anybody who cares about their child has got to be out there supporting it. And uh, I think elders, it's time for elders who no longer have to worry about a job or a promotion, say the truth what the fossil fuel companies are, are, are doing and that profit and the economy and all that has got to come before the very atmosphere that we depend on for our lives. Uh, the children are saying it straight away. Now we've got to support them. Right, and we have to listen. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Suzuki, thank for your you. insights. And we look forward to hearing more from you tonight. Thanks.